Hello and welcome to my channel. I am a sky. I am a VTuber. I am also a person who has a vested interest in history. Uh, particularly what I tend to focus on is material culture. This goes, uh, this encompasses weapons, armor, but I'm also interested in other parts of uh, history such as military history, art history, societal history in general. Uh, I'm just interested in history, straight up. But the area I tend to focus primarily on are arms and armor. Uh, and the area I tend to focus on within this topic is late medieval Europe. So that is the area I know the most about. But I of course dabble in other areas as well. And you cannot, it is impossible, to properly research arms, armor and warfare without also researching society in general, without also researching art history, literary history. These are all heavily intertwined and to gain a complete understanding of the period, you have to have a solid basis of knowledge for all of these things because the sources that we use to learn about historical stuff, to learn about arms and armor or warfare matters, uh, they are art forms, they are written sources, and they cannot be divorced from their societal context. So, obviously, as somebody who researches these things, I have to have at least somewhat of a solid basis of knowledge regarding all of these topics, which I would say I might have, a little bit anyway. But, in this video specifically, I'm going to be talking about the differences between two somewhat confusing uh, pole weapons, the halberd and the polax. I mean, the, the weapons themselves aren't confusing, but the differences between these two are often confusing, and people don't always know the differences between these two. And even if you think you know, you might be wrong, because there's a lot of misunderstandings about what defines a halberd as a halberd, and what defines a polax as a polax. So hopefully, in this video, I'm going to be uh, sharing with you the development of these weapons and uh, that should grant you a better understanding of how these weapons were differentiated both historically and uh, how we today can differentiate these two weapons. So without further ado, we're going to start with the longer of the two sections and this is going to be pretty long so stay strapped and let's begin with the development of the halberds because their presence is uh, well, longer in the medieval period. So I'm going to try to keep this somewhat brief. And of course, before I get into the whole history of this, I should note that there is always going to be grey areas between polaxes and halberds. There's always going to be exceptions. There's always going to be weapons that cannot neatly fit into one category or the other. But what I aim to do here is to provide you with the history of their development and how they were seen historically, how they were used historically, and this should help you categorize at least the vast majority of these weapons into one camp or the other, but you will always find examples which don't neatly fit into these, and that's fine, because not everything has to neatly fit into little boxes. There is this definition around of a halberd. It goes that for a weapon to be defined as a halberd, it has to have a top spike, an axe blade, and a back spike. This definition is entirely modern and does not correspond to historical sources. In fact, for the vast majority of the existence of the halberd, as we see it in historical sources used with that specific word, this form did not exist. Let us go back to the earliest beginnings of the halberd. The halberds derived from the Danax of the uh, late Viking Age and the beginning of the High Medieval Period. We have mentions of the word halberd, or its original German equivalent, the Helmbarte, at least as far back as the early 13th century, and probably there are uh, mentions of it from the 12th century and possibly even earlier, but uh, I do personally have confirmed uh, that it does show up in some texts from the early 13th century at the very least. At this point in time, what are the weapons we're looking at? Well, we have to specifically look at Germany 
the whole Roman Empire, German-speaking areas, because it is in German-speaking areas that the term halberd is used. And why this is important, and as I'm going to get to later, is that it is specifically in German-speaking areas that the popular halberd we know of later originally developed. So this is a purely German development, um, at least when we get to the later uh, iterations of the halberd. Early on, though, they are just generic large broad axes. Etymologically, the word halberd also means this. It comes from the word barte, and barte uh, straight up means beard, but in the context of weapons, it refers to a broad axe or a bearded axe, uh, basically an axe with a very broad blade. In the 13th century, we see axes like this appear, uh, and they are popular all throughout Europe, uh, not just in Germany, they're popular everywhere. Uh, the other part of Helmbarte comes from Halm, meaning shaft or handle or pole, if you want. So you could uh, technically translate halberd to poleaxe. Are you confused yet? Don't worry, I'll get to defining poleaxes a little bit later. Uh, I just like to confuse people a little bit. So the Helmbarte, in essence, literally means a shafted or a hafted broad axe. Now, if you're looking at these weapons that I'm showing right now, and you're thinking, is that not a Bardiche? And the answer is, yes, it is. If you're Eastern European. The word Bardiche actually comes from German Barte. It, the Eastern Europeans they adopted this weapon, most likely from the Holy Roman Empire. And with the weapon itself, they adopted the term Barte. Uh, and they made it, you know, they made it sound more Russian by adding the ending esh to it, and you end up with bardish. Uh, today, most people call these bardish, even if they're not specifically Eastern European examples, but historically speaking, obviously, uh, the Germans and the English and the French, they did not call these bardish. The English and the French called them other things, but since we're focusing on the halberd specifically, that is what the Germans called this specific weapon. And these are the earliest halberds. You might already notice, though, if I pull up this chart, which was absolutely not made by me. Unfortunately, I'm so sorry, but I do not remember the person who made it. I have just had it saved in my files for a very long time, and unfortunately there's no author name on the thing itself. So I'm just going to hope that whoever made it isn't too upset with me using it here in this video. These are all taken from art pieces uh, of the 13th century, and they're labelled from region to region. You can see some English examples and French examples, but I want to direct your attention to the examples from the Holy Roman Empire. Unlike these large axes from all of the other places, the ones from the Holy Roman Empire have a unique development that has already begun to happen in the 13th century, and that is mounting the lower part of the axe to the shaft with a hoop, or an eye, or a socket if you want. All of the others, they're simply riveted directly onto the front of the shaft, but the German ones, they do have a bottom hoop. This is not, like, completely unique to German examples. There are some other uh, axes used in some other places that also have this feature, but it is most notable in German examples because it becomes an almost ubiquitous construction in Germany and in large parts of the Holy Roman Empire, and this is what lays the basis for the later halberd. As the 13th century moves forward and we get to the late 13th century, these German examples have already begun developing differently to how these axes did in most other places in Europe. Most notably, they're getting straighter spines and points that are more optimized for thrusting than other similar axes. 
this development, uh, as you can see here, uh, this is a late 13th century uh, German halberd, and it is already a more of a thrusting weapon than uh, the axes you can see in France or England or uh, Sweden or wherever during this time. As we move on to the early 14th century, uh, there's not a lot of survivals from the early 14th century. However, at this point, they start to develop a very, very pronounced spike, as well as a square blade. And this development continues throughout the 14th century, until we, sometime in the later 14th century, have reached a weapon in a form that is unique to the Holy Roman Empire. This form of the halberd is not seen used anywhere else in any notable numbers. It is localized to Germany, to Switzerland, to Austria, uh, basically to the Holy Roman Empire. Potentially, maybe some examples in Scandinavia, but even in Scandinavia, they're not really used. Um, if you are thinking, isn't this a Vogue? The answer is not really, but I'm going to make a video on Vogue's in a later date. Uh, the usage of the word Vogue to refer to this weapon is a modern misconception. And historically speaking, this is known as a halberd. But then, how do we get from this weapon here on the left to this weapon here on the right? There's still like a large difference between the two and they don't look very similar, do they? Well, thankfully, we do have enough art and enough surviving examples to illustrate the entire development from the left one to the right. Sometime in the early 15th century, from what I can locate in art, this development seems to potentially happen in the first, no, more like the second decade of the 15th century or thereabouts, the halberds begin to get fully wrapped sockets. Uh, earlier on, these were mounted with two hoops at the top of the shaft and at the bottom of the axe blade. Uh, at some point, they started adding spikes, back spikes, into the middle of it. And these back spikes were extended up until that you basically had a whole socket. And at some point, people thought, we're just going to make a whole socket. So they did. And that's what you see here. This is the earliest types of sockets found on halberds. At this point, the construction of these sockets is very simple. You just take uh, an elongated portion of the back of the abs and you rack back of the axe and you wrap it around the shaft and you forge weld it onto the other side of the blade and well, you've got a socket. However, not too long after this development, in another decade or two, seems to happen potentially during the 1430s or the 1440s. It is hard to locate the exact location of this. Um, the construction of the halberd changes, and it starts being constructed by sandwiching two, sorry, by sandwiching the shaft in between two sheets of metal. So previously, the axe would be constructed with just one sheet of metal, cut out and then forged into shape. However, from this point on, halber started being constructed with two sheets of metal cut to the same shape and roughly the same size, which are then forge welded together with the halberd, sorry, with the shaft sandwiched in between the two halberd blades. With this construction changing, you start to see features such as elongating the back portion uh, or of the halberd and integrating the back spikes forged directly into the construction of the axe itself. Now, of course, these back spikes forged into the upper eye of the socket or sometimes the lower eye of the socket were a thing since the late 13th century, but they were rare comparatively. With this new development towards the mid 15th century, the back spike becomes an integral part of the halberd itself, and all designs from this point on do contain this back spike. 
So, uh, the idea that a halberd is defined by having a top spike and a back spike in addition to an axe blade is wrong, because for the existence of the term halberd, it existed for over two centuries before this feature became commonplace. From this point on, it's not too hard to see the development into the later times, and uh, yeah, that's more or less the development of the halberd. Contextually speaking, the halberd develops as a common infantry weapon. It is not a complex construction. Uh, of course, the later halberds tend to be more complex than the earlier halberds, but earlier very simple halberd types are still used well after they're out of fashion, really. Uh, you can see this early uh, 15th century or late 14th century types used throughout the 15th century alongside more modern types into the 16th century. For example, this painting of the Battle of Dornach from, I don't know, around 15 something, 1513, potentially, or 1506, somewhere along those lines anyway, uh, shows uh, these older types of halberds used alongside the more modern types of halberds and very interestingly you can still see some differences on the types of halberds here you can see one of them which contains just the two hoops construction you can see another one which is fully socketed and you can see a third one which has that sort of back spike half socket thing it is very very cool to see these different types of halberds represented on a painting from the early 16th century. And at this point, these types of halberds would be over a century, sorry, not so over a century, but over half a century old easily. Some of them would be over a century old. And they're probably not being made anymore, but they're still kept in use because why throw away a perfectly serviceable weapon? As mentioned, they're an infantry weapon, which means they're generally long, they, are, they have very thin and broad blades, and uh, they are simplistic in their construction because they're meant to be mass-produced in the thousands. So let's move over to the Pollux. This section is going to be a little bit shorter because the Pollux's history itself is a little bit shorter. We start to see the term Pollux appear in English accounts somewhere around the mid 13th, sorry, the mid 14th century. And we start to see weapons that can be defined as poleaxes in art appear slightly after this period. Before moving on with the development of the poleax though, I should note a thing or two about the term poleax in and of itself. The term polax, contrary to popular belief that it comes from the word pole, most likely comes from the word pol, meaning head. Um, in the context of an axe, a pole of the axe would be the back of the head of the axe, so a polax could be interpreted as an axe which contains an implement at the pole, whether this is a spike or a hammer or whatever. So it most likely has nothing to do with pole, but rather refers to an axe blade with a secondary head. And the secondary head could be a spike, or it could be a hammer. The word poleaxe is also not the only term used for this weapon. In fact, more often than not, uh, the weapon is just called axe, or sometimes called battle axe in sources. And in the 15th century particularly, when a text mentions simply an axe, then it's talking about poleaxes in the vast majority of cases. And if they're talking about a smaller one-handed axe, it is often noted as a hand axe, or it is clear from context what they're talking about. But for the most part, this weapon is known simply as axe. In fact, other languages don't even have an equivalent name to Pollux. Um, most of them also just call it Axe. Or in German, you sometimes have the term Mordaxt, which translates roughly to murder axe. But even there, Axe is the usually preferred term. So, contrary to Halbert, 
these axes seem to have developed, particularly as a weapon to be used against armor in slightly more individualistic fighting. Uh, they're not meant for solid infantry formations because the way that the knights tended to fight would be a bit more individual than a solid infantry block. These weapons are developed to, well, to be used in context of knight on knight or heavily armored people on heavily armored people warfare initially. So they're an average shorter, the blades are narrower and thicker because they want to have more weight at the end of the weapon. And also a polax by definition does have to feature a second head. Whether this is a back spike or a back hammer, it doesn't really matter. But for a weapon to count as a polax, this has to be present. The earliest depiction of what can reasonably say it, said to be a fully formed polax comes from this French manuscript. Uh, this particular manuscript uh, is said to be dated to 1368. It is possible that this specific miniature dates to one or two decades later than 1368, but late 14th century broadly is still where we can put the beginnings of the Pollux too. And then during the 15th century, they developed further in around the 1420s or 30s, we have the appearance of the iconic square hammers and also the straight blades that uh, become popular on polaxes, on surviving polaxes that we have from later on in the 15th century. Right at the 1420s though, we do not see the square hammers at the back, we do not see straight blades. Polaxes then tend to have curved blades and more simplistic hammers or back spikes. However, the main thing which differentiates a polax from a halberd in the 15th century is that polaxes start to be constructed in a manner where they're not a single piece. The head is separated from the top spike and the longettes, longettes being shaft reinforcements, uh, which are two separate pieces, and the longettes are overlaid onto the head, and the head is then secured with fasteners at the side of the longettes. This construction is obviously more complex than a halberd, uh, and they can be more complex and they are more complex because they're generally considered higher end weapons. They quickly become one of the quintessential weapons for knights, and while they're not limited to knights, it is extremely common for knights to use them, and they're often tailored towards that use. Of course, you can still find in master roles uh, commoners owning polaxes, so it's not like they cannot access them by any means, they could, they did. But its development is more catered towards knights, men at arms, it's catered towards people with a lot of armor, um, and not as catered towards people without a lot of armor. However, and here we come to the other part of the polax, besides the difference and more complex construction, that differentiates the halberd from the polex, and that is that a polex does not need to have a axe blade. While a halberd is defined by having an axe blade, a polex is not, even though it sounds counterintuitive. The reason for this is that, well, due to their role often as being an armored fighting weapon, at some point somebody figured that you might have slightly more effect against armor if you swap out the axe blade for another implement and then you get designs like this these hammer types with a hammer head and a beak but this is still considered polaxes because the heads are constructed in the same manner as polaxes and more importantly the techniques transfer very neatly from one type of polax to the other there is not a lot of techniques that cannot be done with either of them because an axe blade can be used for hooking uh, and striking much in the same way that a beak and a hammerhead can. So even though these three types of polaxes look very different and are specialized in slightly different roles, their overall use can actually be extremely similar and you can use the same techniques with them uh, well, 
more or less without change. If you take a look at fencing manuals of the 15th century of the Pollacks in armour, uh, the vast majority of cases, the manuals which clearly mention the axe, will showcase these hammer-headed types. And these hammer-headed types, if you're French, can sometimes call, be called a Bec de Corbin or a Bec de Faucon, but it's clear that they're still just considered a subtype of axe, because they're just a variation of the Polex, they're not a completely separate weapon. So, if you read the word axe in a 15th century medieval text, there's two things you should take away from it. One, it's probably referring to a poleaxe, and two, it does not necessarily mean that it has an axe blade, it just means that it's referring to this type of weapon. So, with that being said, that should, more or less, um, give you a good look at the differences between poleaxes and halbers generally. Of course, as I mentioned earlier in the video, there's always going to be exceptions, the grey areas, whatever. Earlier poleaxes were not constructed in the two-piece manner with the top spike separate to the head. Um, they were in one piece, and there's some later examples which also have in one piece, such as these two here um, that you can see. These would reasonably be counted as poleaxes because they do have polex like attributes of having very narrow, thicker blades, uh, uh, which is in contrast to general halberd, but they're still constructed in one piece, so they're different from your average polex of this period. So, would you call this a polex or would you call this a halberd? I personally would call this a polex, but you could call it a halberd and you probably wouldn't be wrong. You also have cases of shorter halberds being seen or longer poleaxes being seen. In this uh, depiction from the 1490s in Italy, we have a poleax that is of generally halberd length, um, and the author Pietro Monte, which was a knight, recommends the pol your poleax to be about as tall as you are with your hand stretched above your head as far as it goes. Which is a very big difference to the poleaxes which we see depicted in England or in Burgundy or even in Germany a few decades prior to Pietro Monte in the mid 15th century, which are very short. Uh, they can sometimes be chin height or even chest height, such as from this from the Bouchon Pajon. And often they do not exceed the length of a man. So, uh, there's cases of long poleaxes, there's cases of short halberds, like in the manual of Paulus Karl, sorry, not Paulus Karl, Peter Falkner, I mix those two up sometimes, um, which talks about the fencing of axe in armour, but uses the term halberd for the weapons he's depicting, which do look more like halberds than your average poleax, and might be a specific form of halberd for dueling, which is shorter and more constructed like a polex, or they might just be polexes and he's calling them halberds, we can't really tell. Then there is examples like these from the late 14th century. Uh, these are constructed like polexes in the sense that they've got top spikes and back hammers or back spikes. But the blades themselves are broad. And how do you classify one of these? I don't tend to call it a polex. It can be counted as a polex, but um, the term I tend to use for this is gizarm, because we do know that the term gizarm in English and French can be synonymous to large axe. Uh, but if this uh, weapon, if you're German, you can call this a halberd, probably, and wouldn't be wrong. So, you know, there's always grey areas, there's always exceptions. I might make a video on these two specifically, and gizarms, because I love talking about these, all of these weapons. Uh, but I'm just going to briefly mention them as a footnote in this video. But, exceptions aside, I hope you learned something today. I hope you got some good information on what differentiates a halberd. And a polex. And to reiterate, Albert 
generally a more simplistic construction, broader, narrower blades, sorry, broader, thinner blades, and longer shafts, all axes in general, a higher end construction meant for armored combat, generally shorter with thicker, narrower blades, and with multi piece constructed heads, a more complex construction. Polaxes don't need to have axe heads, Alberts don't need to have top or back spikes. And that's the gist of it. Hope you enjoyed. Hope it was informative. If you have any questions, if you want to argue, whatever, leave a comment down below. I'll try to get to it as much as I can. Until then, I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you all some other time.